Well, hi, everyone. When I was growing up, I always wanted to be six feet tall. But by the time I was a soccer goalie in college, I had topped out at a pitiful five feet, eight and one half inches. Sadly, I did not make six foot. And how I, could, how I wish I could just add that one half inch so at least I could say I was 5'9". <laughs> but then I found a secret to doing just that. Every night, I do one thing when I go to bed. And the next morning, I wake up a half inch taller. Seriously. And you can do that too. Hi, uh, in this episode, I'm going to tell you how and also give you some interesting thoughts about our culture and your character. I'm Doug Newton, pastor for 45 years, a national award-winning magazine editor, author of 24 books, and this is At the Intersection with Doug Newton, where scripture, culture, and character meet. And I'm here to help you pursue the kind of character needed to align with scripture faithfully and to engage culture graciously. Each week, I make one observation about our culture, uh, I give one insight that the Bible speaks to that issue, and I suggest one way to strengthen the character that you and I need to relate to our mixed-up world with exemplary grace and fresh impact. Now, this is a no-gripe zone. <clears throat> our question is not what's wrong with our culture. It's about what's the right way to respond. So, here we go. You ready? You know, it really is true. <clears throat> I've discovered the one thing that I can do every night to wake up the next morning a half an inch taller. Can you guess what I'm talking about? <laughs> I lie down to sleep, and I wake up taller. That's because the downward force of gravity during the day compresses your spinal column as the day wears on. You lie, you lie down, and then the spinal column decompresses. <laughs> gravity is an amazing force. Even though gravity works against my lifelong desire to be taller, without it, we all would be just flying apart, which means we couldn't exist, right? Gravity is the force of attraction between two objects. The more massive each object, the more attraction. And notice I said massive. I didn't just talk about their size. Mass has to do with how densely packed their atoms and molecules are. So, for example, a king-size down pillow does not have as much mass as a 200-page book, which is much smaller. But it's amazing what mass does. I mean, it's the mass of the Earth that holds the moon in its orbit. But then it's also the moon's mass that pulls the less dense water of the oceans toward itself as the Earth rotates, causing low and high tides. So why am I talking or taking time to talk about gravity? Because this is another case in which the physical world provides us with an analogy for understanding the spiritual and moral world. Just as gravity is needed in the physical world to keep things from flying apart, human beings need moral gravity to keep all the elements of their life, thoughts, emotions, actions, relationships, from flying apart. The more our thoughts, emotions, actions, and relationships are closely packed together around a common meaning and purpose, the more together we feel. The less connected these elements of life are to this common meaning and purpose, the less whole we feel, the less together, the less integrated. Simply put, to have moral gravity, we need to have a similar answer to the question, why? behind the various aspects of our lives. Of course, there's the biggie, why am I alive? But then so many other things. You know, why am I thinking these thoughts right now? Why am I satisfying this particular desire? Why am I making this choice? Why do I have this goal? You know, when all of those whys come together, you've got moral gravity. But, but how does a person make all of those elements combine? Well, I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but first... I need to point out what you probably have already noticed about our culture. There's very little moral gravity holding people's lives and relationships together these days. I mean, this accounts for many of the struggles and behaviors we see in our world today. 
there is an exponential increase in forms of depression. It seems like there's just chronic aimlessness among, among so many people, fears of the future, frivolous pleasure-seeking, and especially the masking of disappointment and disillusionment with all sorts of things like drugs or money or shopping or just adrenaline rush experiences. So many of these conditions track back to the lack of a strong sense of meaning and purpose. Now, how did things get this way? Well, I, I see at least a couple things. Global instability and what I would call global inundation. Thinking of global instability, arguably the 20th century was a century of seismic upheavals, world wars, oil wars, uh, wars against different forms of government, communism and so forth, economic collapses and competition. And this global instability did two things at least. It made people much less optimistic about humanity's future. And it also made it much more difficult for people to believe in a higher being, you know, someone providing a moral foundation to which every human could relate in some way to find secure values and meaning. And then thinking of global inundation, automation and technology has made possible global communications, global travel, explosion of of uh, information and exposed individuals to a, a world that's literally too big for us to comprehend. On top of that, and because of that, the average person now knows <laughs> that we inhabit a tiny planet on the edge of a tiny galaxy among a universe of millions of galaxies. This overwhelming inundation did two things. I mean, it made people feel small and insignificant. How, how, how do we matter in, in such a, a universe? But it also put people in touch like never before with diverse religious beliefs, diversity in cultural values, diversity in social norms, pushing us toward relativism and subjectivism. I mean, today it seems like there's no such thing for anyone or at least this is what we're told, as truth with a capital T. We each, we're told, just have our own truth. But you know, that's not much to stand on if you're looking for a sure foundation for finding meaning and purpose. The entire Western culture has, has shifted away from purpose-based living to what seems to be the only other alternative, a, a foundationless, pleasure-oriented and often self-seeking existence. There's simply no gravity in that kind of life. So what's the remedy? I mean, how do people in our culture regain moral gravity? Well, one thing's for sure. They're going to have to come into contact with people of moral gravity and wind up admiring them and desiring that kind of life that they're living. They're going to have to see people who manifest the characteristic traits of people who have moral gravity, integrity, contentment, focus, joy, peace, confidence, hope, perseverance. I mean, these, these are the personal qualities that explain why Jesus said to his followers that you can be light and salt in an otherwise dark and decaying world. People can be drawn out of their aimlessness, out of their disillusionment and meaninglessness, and, and the tide in their lives can turn in the direction of, of meaning and purpose by the gravitational pull of people like us who live with a prominent singularity of meaning and purpose in our lives. And you can be one of those people who has that gravitational pull and influence on others, but it's not automatic. I mean, even though it sounds like it is, by the way, Jesus said, you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. But, but remember, in each case, he then pointed out that something can change. The light can be hidden. The salt can lose its saltiness. And this all happens by our choices as light and salt. So how do you ensure that you have this 
attractive moral gravity by becoming more intentional about investing as much of what you think, feel, choose, and do with one singular purpose. And so now the question, how do you do that? Well, the first thing is you have to live by this principle. Investing meaning in the elements of your life is your job. No one else's. You choose the why for the things you do, whether it's as mundane as going to the store or as major as going to college. You choose the why. Now, you may say, but but sometimes I go to the store just because my spouse asked me to. I didn't choose to. Oh, yes, you did. You see, you still had a choice whether to honor her request or not. If you fulfilled her request, it, it could have been for a variety of reasons. Maybe you just didn't want to make her mad. Or, or you wanted to be helpful, or because you also wanted to stop at Home Depot, <laughs> or, or you wanted to be fair, and she went to the store for you yesterday, and so you did it. So even though she asked, you still chose why you decided to do it. Everything you do still comes back to your reason why. Investing meaning in your actions is your job, even when bad things happen to you. In 1947, psychologist Viktor Frankl wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's regarded as one of the top top 10 books of the 20th century. Frankl was the father of logotherapy, a form of therapy around this idea that you choose the meaning for everything you do and are going through. Now, the first half of this book describes his horrifying three-year experience in the infamous Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz, where, where he, he witnessed the most depraved human behavior and torturous conditions. But as he describes in his book, there were men there who survived by choosing to invest in their horrific conditions a transcendent, transcendent sense uh, of meaning that sustained them. Frankel was prone to quote the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who said, he who has the why to live can bear almost any how. And Frankel himself wrote, in the concentration camp, what alone remains is the last of human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude or their meaning in a given set of circumstances. So, uh, and by the way, this would be a fantastic book if you want to read, especially that, that, um, that first half. The other gets a little bit more technical as it goes into his, his logotherapy. Uh, and I'll give you a link on how to find that. In, um, on, when, I, when I post this, this uh, podcast, I'll put it in the description below. But the point is you can invest meaning in everything in your life, from the mundane to the major, from the happiest to the most horrible And Paul would concur with this, you know. He said, if you remember, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, see all of the things, in your, all of the details, do it all for the glory of God. He also wrote, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, again, see, whatever, all of the things, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then he wrote again, whatever you do, I mean, are we getting the point? Whatever, everything in your life, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. You see, according to Paul, everything you do needs to be driven by a big meaning and purpose. Now, here's the second thing. You need to identify a very specific season of life why, a particular meaning and purpose for your life now. I mean, obviously, Paul's meaning is the the ultimate meaning, the purpose for everything throughout your whole life, to glorify God. But it's almost too vague because it's so huge. you got to find something more specific. So you can use the relentless how that we learned in episodes 8 and 9 to identify this more particular seasonal uh, why. Let me illustrate. Let me say your ultimate purpose meaning is, well, I I want to bring glory to God. Well, then ask yourself, how am I going to do that, generally speaking? And you might answer, well, by fulfilling his plans for my life. But then you ask yourself, well, how am I going to do that at this time in my life, in this season in my life? And, And you go to prayer, reflection, discernment, 
look at circumstantial guidance in your life and and you might say, you want, well, you know, I think in this time of my life, I, I'm called to be an effective Christian teacher in the public schools. You see, within just two to three rounds of the relentless how, a more specific why is beginning to emerge to create something that sounds like sort of a, a personal mission for this time in your life. That's what we're talking about with this idea of meaning and purpose. And that sense of purpose then shines a question on everything that you choose during that season. You know, you're going, why am I doing this? Does it serve my purpose to be an effective Christian teacher in a public school? Is there a good reason why? And here are all the kind of, you ask these questions about, you know, whatever you do, like Paul says. Is there a good reason why I'm eating what I'm eating? Is there a good reason why I'm reading or watching what I'm now putting into my mind? Is there a good reason why I'm choosing to associate with this or that person? Using my time this way, following the input or the example of this person. Is there a good reason that, that really fulfills or works toward this meaning and purpose that I have? Is there a reason why I'm reacting to challenges uh, this way in my life? Because, you know, a lot of times we'll react differently to challenges if we have a particular uh, meaning or purpose in our, in our life. Is there a reason why I'm spending my money this way that ties into my overall purpose for this season? Is there a reason why I'm making this commitment? Is there a reason why I'm devoting my energy to this task? You see how it works? This relentless why about everything that you're doing. And as you keep asking that question why for everything you're doing to make sure it tracks back to the meaning and purpose that you've embraced for that season in your life, moral gravity increases in your life. And the people around you they're going to pick up on that. You may not even be aware of what's going to be impressing them, but they will be impressed by your focus, by your steadiness, by your confidence, by your perseverance, by your sense of direction. They're going to see you go through challenges, perhaps, and even setbacks, and then still kind of rise back up and, and keep pressing forward. And that's going to be admirable and always inspirational. It's, it's what people need to see in this world that lacks moral gravity. Now, normally at this point each week, I announce a crosswalk guide for you to use, and I leave it to you to work on some exercises to practice the particular character traits that I was talking about that's needed to grace your corner of the world with fresh impact. But I'm so excited. I've got something extra special to offer this week. I want to invite anyone who's interested to join me on an open Zoom gathering Wednesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Central Time. I'm not going to do it during noon because I know that there's a lot of people that can't meet here at noon uh, and they, they get on the podcast later. So I'm trying to pick a, a, an evening time that will be able to hit more people. But this is going to be a Zoom gathering for a guided conversation and a Q&A on using the relentless how and why methods in your life. You see, I am deeply committed to not just telling people what to do or try to offer advice, but then to help them know how to do it. I don't want to be like Pharisees who who lay heavy burdens on people and then don't lift a finger to help them lift. So, so helping you know how and practice is, is a, a core uh, conviction of mine uh, as regards not just this podcast, but my life. So I, I, I want to offer this time where we're actually all together and we start working on these things to benefit each other. Now, I, I won't force anyone to talk on this Zoom time. But I'd love to work with a group of people who want the benefit of this kind of gathering to listen to one another and to rethink or refine your own why for this season of your life. You know, we all need to do that periodically. You know, really kind of refine it every one or two years. So what's yours? Would you like to just be around some people and just kind of listen to how they are retooling, rethinking, refining, and maybe coming up with a fresh description of the meaning and purpose for, for their lives right now? Well, because of this special event, I'm not going to do a Wednesday noon podcast for the next two weeks. 
I want to give you time to, to prepare. I'm going to need you to sign up for, for this, um, this uh, crosswalk because I'm going to send you a, uh, it's going to be a, a special crosswalk. It's a by invitation only crosswalk for those that want to jo join the Zoom link. And I'll, I'll give you what that link is at that time. I'll give you more information to help you prepare for this time. And again, you can just come and listen or you can participate in the conversation. Either way, it's going to be a great experiment in, in making what is my dream, really, this At the Intersection with Doug Newton, a podcast community of people who are working together on our character. So again, it's by invitation only. So please sign up by sending me an email at doug at fresh-impact.com. Well, I appreciate your uh, interest in this podcast. And I ask you again if you would share it with your friends. Subscribe to the Fresh Impact YouTube channel. Uh, there'll be a permanent version of this podcast, as there is of all the others, uh, within 24 hours up on YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, and there's also going to be the audio version on, on the um, various podcast opportunities. All of the links to these things are going to be found at the end of this video. So anyways, thanks again for tuning in. I would love to hear you, uh, hear from you, send, you, send your thoughts to me about what else you might like me to address on this podcast from time to time. But remember... I'd love to see many of you in two weeks for this special Zoom gathering of At the Intersection with Doug Newton, May 17th, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. The regular podcast is going to resume Wednesday, May 24th at noon. I'm already looking forward to meeting you again the next time. I'll see you then.